Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, my sister's been after me again. It's time for Q&A because I've gotten so many questions. So it's time to answer them all. And these, this is actually amazing. I've gotten a ton of questions from everybody. Some of them are actually <laughs> fascinating. Others are, well, I won't count. Okay, so here's what we'll started off. Is uh, If someone is homesick with COVID or RSV, is there a risk of an infection to pet dogs or cats. Now, of course, that's one of my favorite ones. Uh, well, so cats and dogs have been shown to ha be able to be infected with COVID. And re remember the pet store in Hong Kong a couple of years ago that closed down because they had a whole bunch of hamsters that had COVID. But, you know, it's really, they don't get very sick. And, you know, so there's an actual recommendation that says if you're really sick, you should not hang around your pets. But actually, <laughs> when you get sick, you want to hang around your pet. So I, my feeling is if you're sick and you have a dog or a cat and you want to hang with it, just hang with it. They rarely get uh, very serious, seriously ill. Now, RSV, we just don't know much about it, but it's not thought to be a major pathogen for, for cats and dogs. Okay, I still see people sterilizing surfaces, but uh, I've never seen evidence that surface contact or contagion represents an important round of SARS-CoV-2. What's the evidence? So we reviewed that last week. First time we had a real study in the Lancet that actually infected people, put them in separate rooms, and then sampled all the surfaces and masks and the air. And it turns out that they could detect virus uh, for the first 12 hours or so on uh, surfaces in about 25% of the, of the time. And they could even capture viable virus, but it, 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 it dies very quickly. So it's not unlike the original SARS, uh, which was very transmissible by contact, SARS-CoV-2 really has not been uh, all that transmissible. It has been shown to be a, a prominent way. It's mostly aerosolization. But, you know, it's always a good idea to wipe surfaces clean because there's a number of pathogens that can't be uh, passed around that way. So if someone's sick in the house, you know, I tend to wipe surfaces clean and wash your hands. These are important things uh, to do in any case. Uh, so then CDC has long said that COVID is not transmitted by food, even if the food is contaminated with COVID. So why can you spread when you touch your eyes or your nose, but not your mouth? So that's a really good question. Uh, mucous membranes, the surfaces are how the virus gets in initially. Uh, and so your eyes and your upper airway is very susceptible to transmission through these aerosolized particles. But when you swallow stuff, it goes into your stomach and the acidity of your stomach usually kills everything. So. Uh, and saliva in your mouth is, is really very good at aggregating proteins. So it's really hard to transmit things through the mouth and the gut, the, the upper, uh, the stomach. So it's eyes and upper nose, yes. Swallowing food, no. So it's not been transmitted through contaminated food. Uh, when will we expect the vaccine that prevents infection rather than protecting against serious disease? This is a really, really good uh, question. Remember, the original developing, the development of these vaccines was done based on symptoms. So, you know, the reduction in symptoms, not the prevention of infection. So the problem we've talked about a lot is that while you get in a vaccination or even infection, you generate this IgG response that's very good once the virus is in your blood at, at preventing it uh, from causing serious disease. But it gets in through the mucous membranes and that there's an antibody IgA that is in the surface of, of your nose and upper airways. And that's what is going to be needed to prevent even, you know, infection. So maybe the nasal spray vaccines that are being developed might be, might be useful, but it's going to be very difficult to prevent infection. So you look at something like polio vaccine, which does prevent infection. It's replicating in your gut on the, in the surface where the polio virus is. And so it, it, it's very effective at preventing even the early uh, uh, in, input of the, of the virus. Whereas these ones, these upper airway things get in, but your body has the IgG to prevent a serious disease. So here's one, I'm a retired RN. I'm wondering how you can recommend uh, every, that everyone get the uh, latest vaccine over the age of six months. In my reading, I learned that the FDA approved the vaccines based on almost no data there's no human clinical trial. So, okay, this is a little confusing. So if you'll recall, uh, the original vaccines were approved, both Pfizer and Moderna, 
in very large clinical efficacy trials. We actually, Baylor, participated in, in both trials. And the safety and efficacy was, was established in those trials. Uh, in the, in the uh, Pfizer trial, for example, there were 30,000 volunteers, uh, and the, the vaccine efficacy was 94% in, in pr pr protecting against symptoms. And in, it was 100% effective in that study in preventing serious disease. In fact, severe disease occurred in the placebo control group with 30 participants and some and one fatality in the placebo group. So there is plenty of data in the original vaccine development that is done in large populations of people. But like flu, the updated vaccines are different. So what they do in the updated vaccines, since the platform's already deemed uh, safe and effective, what they have to show is preclinical data that shows that there's an improvement. And so that was done, and we showed a study in mice, for example, uh, for the um, Pfizer study. The original vaccine was generated this kind of antibodies, but the newest vaccine generated better response, particularly to the circulating variants. There was a Moderna trial in people that looked at before and then after vaccination with the newest uh, variant. Uh, the XBB 1.5, and it showed that there was an improved response to XBB 1.5, EG5, BA 2.86, and XBB 1.16. So there were, this is a small clinical trial, but it, like the flu vaccine, once the, the platform is established as effective and safe, then minor changes are not required to have a giant clinical trial. Otherwise, we'd never get approval for these things rapidly each year. So. Uh, this is the way the vaccines are approved. I strongly recommend that anyone over the age of six months gets the latest uh, vaccine variant because, frankly, uh, it is very effective at the latest circulating variants. Here's another one. I got my last COVID vaccine on May 26th this year. I'm over 65. When should I get the new updated COVID booster that came, that came out in September? I'd say right now. It's been four months, and uh, the, when you were vaccinated, uh, in May did not have the latest variant. So like you, I would get mine. Like you, I got mine. So I would, I would definitely get it now. Uh, how we fare with COVID in the upcoming season is strongly uh, driven by vaccination uptake. The big question is, will, will there be an increase in coverage that will match like what we do with flu? And where are we right now? <clears throat> well, it's a little hard to tell because we no longer mandate reporting for the vaccine. So last week, the CDC estimated that 2% of the eligible population, 4 million people, had had their vaccine thus far, and it was about the same as last year. Eventually, we got to about 20 or 30% of the population. CNN, I don't know where they got this data, reported 7 million Americans. So they, they reported four times more had been updated, uh, had gotten the updated vaccine. They got that based on HHS data, uh, Health and Human Services. RSV, we don't know what the uptake is yet. Flu data is interesting. Generally around uh, 55 to 60 percent of, of kids under the age of uh, 17 get the flu vaccine. Uh, last year it was around 57.4 percent. Uh, and then in adults it's more around 47 or 48 percent. And the reason this is important is if you look at the each, this is three years in a row, uh, each color represents a different year. And, and how many people were vaccinated. And re remember, we all learned about R, the R not, uh, the, the infection number. You know, with, with COVID, it's like almost 10 or 11. With uh, flu, it's an R not of about one to two. Well, why is that important? You get to herd immunity uh, with the formula. We went through this very early on the, in the pandemic. Herd immunity is one minus one over the R not number. So, if R0 is two, then it'd be 50%. You'd reach herd immunity if 50% of the population was immune. The reason they target 70% is not everybody has a great immune response to the vaccine, so you'd like to overshoot. But if you hit 70% of the population being resistant, then you don't get a big uh, outbreak and it's, uh, you reach herd immunity. Of course, it not only varies by who gets vaccinated, but Apparently, the adoption of vaccination is different by states. If you look, here are all the different states. At the low end, of course, is Idaho, Wyoming, Nevada, and our own beloved Texas. The high end for vaccination adoption is 
the Northeast, pretty much Vermont, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, et cetera. So anyway, get your flu vaccine. Let's make Texas a leader in vaccination. Okay, uh, that's enough. I'm done. Uh, anyway, I want to end up uh, this week with some shout outs. First of all, uh, I want to uh, congratulate our entire clinical practice. Uh, they were recognized in the American Heart Association with a number of uh, gold and silver recommendations, uh, uh, recognitions for uh, their outstanding practice uh, in the management of hypertension, cholesterol, and diabetes. So that you know, when you come to the clinic and you you know you expect outstanding care, here's uh, objective evidence that the clinic at Baylor College of Medicine is providing the highest level of care, uh, which will bo both improve your uh, your wellness as well as your longevity. So congratulations to our, our overall practice uh, at, at, at Baylor. I also want to congratulate um, an investigator team led by Dr. Lee in neuroscience that received an Innovation Fund Award from the Pew Charitable Trust. This is one of six teams that will partner on interdisciplinary research projects exploring key questions in biology and disease. The team at Baylor and NYU will explore what happens in the brain when we change our minds, a poorly understood aspect of decision making. I change my mind all the time, so if you can figure that one out, it would be helpful. Also, Governor Greg Abbott has appointed Dr. Shweta Shah, one of our pediatric nephrologists, to the Chronic Kidney Disease Task Force. This is a force, the group that's in, trying to coordinate the state's uh, plan for prevention screening diagnosis management of chronic kidney disease. And of course, the most important thing this week was the costume uh, selection. You all voted, tremendous number of votes, uh, and it came down, uh, just 10 votes separating the first and second place. But the first place winner was uh, Mystery Witch, uh, and the second place winner, won my sister won, it was Cool Bones, but fantastic. And also a giant shout out to one viewer, who suggested that Lily goes Taylor Swift and I go as the Kansas City Chiefs player Travis Kelsey. Now, she could pull off Taylor Swift. I don't think I could pull off Travis Kelsey. Anyway, have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.